Um, but um, so let me begin. This is uh, for me the most fascinating thing I've ever done. Uh, partly the timing is is very good, but uh, also because what's happening is quite spectacular. Um, I, um, if, if you looked in yesterday's New York Times, you would have seen an article about the fact that Russia is having some trouble with the fact that oil prices are dropping. So uh, my wife says to me, your book's obsolete. I said, no, not quite yet. Uh, <laughs> but um, it certainly is a time of very dynamic change. And I'm going to do something that uh, authors, I, when they do it and I'm listening, I hate, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to read to you, just, not just a little bit, not the whole thing, but I'm going to, I'm going to read the, the first page. Um, I used an agent for the first time in my life. I've never done that before. And she said, you know, you're doing something different. You're, writing, you're not writing a textbook and you can't tell your students that they'd better read it because they're going to be tested on it. Uh, when you have a general audience, you can't, you'd like to do that, but you can't do it. Uh, so you've got to make it so they want to read it. I said, well, if I do that, I'll lose my license as an economist. But uh, she said, do it anyway. So what to, what to say, how to, how to handle that? Well, as you heard, I've had a chance to um, participate in a group that ultimately ends up meeting with Putin, which is quite an unusual opportunity. Uh, but before that, it's called the Valdai Hills Discussion Group, which is organized by uh, Novosti Press Agency in an effort to brainwash critics. Um, and you can judge for yourself whether they've done that w with me. But they, they invite us to Russia. They take us around, and this particular year they were taking us out to the oil fields. The theme was energy. So I told my agent, well, I'm going out to, the, out to Siberia, to the Priobsky oil field. Maybe I'll find something there. So they took us out there, but uh, it was interesting, but I would really have had to stretch to try to make it uh, jazzy to begin. But then they also took us to the Gazprom headquarters. For those of you who've been in Moscow, Gazprom has this giant uh, a, a skyscraper or office building, partly glass in the southwest part of, of Moscow. It's, it stands alone when you're in there. You, you, you can't miss it. Uh, and I went into this building and I said, well, maybe here I've got something. And in particular because I began to fantasize. Maybe that's what economists do all the time. But in this particular case, it was an unusual kind of fantasy. And you'll hear, I, let me just read it and stop talking. Anyway, it begins, the author is James Bond. So there's the fantasy. I mean, uh, <clears throat> at first I was puzzled. Where were they taking us for such a big, sleek, Glass Moscow high-rise, Gazprom's elevator and its headquarters building was tiny. Five people could barely squeeze in and its hall corridors narrow. Here's this big building and this small elevator, narrow corridors. <clears throat> this was, after all, the world's largest producer of natural gas, not to mention Russia's largest company. Following a short walk, we were ushered into a darkened, silent room where nothing seemed to be happening. It was a room something like this, except it was dark, and there was just a big wall here. Strange, strange. It was only when all the members of our group had made their way up on the elevators that the room suddenly came alive. Then for a time I felt as if I'd wandered into a NASA space center. Uh, or was it a James Bond movie set? Uh, all that was missing was that out-of-body voice intoning, Welcome, Mr. Goldman. We were expecting you, you know, if you've seen James. So here's this big wall uh, behind me. In, in front of me, where you're sitting, covering the whole 100-foot wall of the room was a map with a spiderweb-like maze of natural gas pipelines reaching from East Siberia west to the, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean and from the Arctic Ocean south to the Caspian and Black Seas. Manipulating this display were Gazprom dispatches, three men controlling the flow of Gazprom's gas to East uh, and West European consumers of this Russian natural gas monopoly. No wonder there was such tight security. And the lights were blinking, you could see where the gas pipelines were going and where the gas was moving. <clears throat> there was also a sense of self-assurance. As measured by the value of its corporate stock by the summer of 2006 when we were there, Gazprom, the state-dominated joint stock corporation, until 1992, it was actually the Soviet Ministry of the Gas Industry, had become the world's third largest corporation. Only private shareholder-owned ExxonMobil and General Electric were larger. 
One more sentence. With a flick of a switch, those dispatchers sitting in this Moscow room could freeze and indeed have frozen entire countries. At the very least, they could send their citizens off in a panic in search of sweaters, scarves, and blankets. And then to top it off, I managed to find a picture of that, of that dispatching room here with the maps and, and, and all this. I mean, it's it just incredibly exotic, and you had the sense of, of very real power. Now, I read that to give you this feeling of, of an immense power. And, and if you remember, uh, just, a de just a decade earlier, of, not then, it was even less, only eight years earlier than that, but just August 17th, 1998, was when the Russian stock market collapsed and the the Russia defaulted on its debt. The country was basically broke. Uh, it, it had ramifications here. You remember some of American bankers, Bankers Trust, for example, had, had a write-off $200 million, long-term capital management, in uh, Greenwich, uh, Connecticut was about to collapse and the Federal Reserve Bank had to step in. It's, it's particularly interesting today because it's deja vu. Or, you know, the Federal Reserve Bank again is having to step in for this kind of thing. But this was, in, in 1998, something that came really out of, out of, out of Moscow. Uh, and they were broke. The Treasury was, well, had a few million dollars, but not, not much more than that. So. This is what happens. The country uh, really is falling apart. Now, I don't know, there were some handouts. I don't know if you, you, you got, did anybody get any handouts? Um, she was going to hand them out. Do you know where she went? Oh my. Well, uh, it was to be handed out before, not after the lecture. Um, well, you won't be, nobody's going to be able to see this, but... Uh, uh, Anyway, let me try uh, until it comes because um, this is, uh, uh, <laughs> you can see a white piece of paper about, that's about as much as I think you can see. Uh, uh, this is from 1992 uh, to 1997 where there's a slight uptick and then there's 1998. This shows the GDP of Russia. The dark is the GDP. Oil production is the lighter thing and you can see it's all down. It's, it's dropping, the GDP was dropping by as much as 16% a year. If you accumulate the whole thing, uh, Russia at, at, at that point uh, was, it was worse than the, the Great Depression we suffered in the 1930s. Uh, and what is significant about all that is that uh, in, after the collapse, this is 1998, do you know where those handouts are? Well, did I end up taking them all? That doesn't help. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, not only am I late, but I'm a goofball, so there, what are you going to... Anyway, there may not be enough for everybody, so if you, you may have to share. But those of you who get it, you can see, you can see just how dramatic the collapse in the Yeltsin years uh, was. Um, with a slight uptick again, and I say 1997. Well, the, the, the important thing F is, is that after uh, 1998, in August 1999, uh, Yeltsin appoints Vladimir Putin as the prime minister. And so this is 1999, and look what happens. It just completely turns around uh, this way. So it's just the opposite of what had been happening uh, uh, before. So, uh, at the end of this period, uh, at least until a month ago, uh, Russia had turned around. The cumulative growth here, uh, it's growing 7-8% a year for 10 years, for the decade, and if you accumulate that, that comes to a doubling of the GDP. So, in, in, during his, his 10 years in office, basically, or, or basically eight years, but eight and a half years, under Putin, the Russian economy has just reversed itself and has become very prosperous. Russia is basically back. And it all happened on Putin's watch. Uh, the other thing, of course, uh, is, is to see just the contrast before, before Putin and after Putin uh, when this is uh, all taking place. So you can understand why the polls will show that, the public opinion polls will show that, that Putin uh, has a public support rating of 70 to 80 percent. Um, now, so the question is, 
Would, what I'm going to try to address in the lecture, would Russia be any different if uh, Putin had not been uh, the prime minister and then in January 2000 had been made the provisional uh, president and then won the election in March 2000? Would any of this have been different? Would Russia, would Russia have been different if uh, without him? Now, I I'm, have lectured long enough in my life to know at the beginning of the lecture everybody's awake. I mean, look around, nobody's sleeping. Uh, by the middle of the lecture, don't look around. Uh, there'll be several people sleeping. By the end of the lecture, other people, when's he going to finish? Let's get out of here. So I'll tell you the answer now. Uh, so when you go home, you'll know. It, what did he say? Everybody will know. Uh, whereas usually at the end of the lecture, I'm not sure what he said. Well, anyway, the answer is, Without Putin, it would have, this country still would have grown. Uh, and the reason, of course, is that oil prices went from about $10 a barrel until, about, until July when they were almost $150 a barrel. Uh, I tell my wife that if I had been the president, uh, the prime minister, and then the president of Russia, under those circumstances, even I would have been able uh, to have turned Russia around. She doubts it, but, but with the prices going that high, that fast, uh, it's clear that uh, this made an enormous difference. So what, what did Putin do? Well, it turns out Putin did make a big difference, and that's what I want to talk about. So yes, I give him credit for it. But, but it's the oil prices that make the difference. The other thing to notice if you've got those tables, if, if you look, you'll see the, it's a lighter line. By the time it's been copied, it's, it's, it's not pure white anymore. But that's the, the other line that's going on there is oil production, physical oil production, barrels, uh, tons as the Russians would use. And you can see, again, without fail, when oil production drops, GDP drops. Without fail, when oil production goes up, GDP goes up. This is because Russia is a mono economy, a mono culture, basically. It's all, it's very heavily dependent on oil and gas, for that matter. Uh, now, and if you, you know, they, they don't go up the same percentage near the end when they're going up. But if you took price change, in other words, talked about total revenue earned from exports or production of oil, then they would, they would approximate much closer. So you can see the role of oil. It's oil that makes a difference. It's gas that makes a difference. That's why this is called petrostate. Again, my wife said, you're making a mistake. People think it's prostate. It's not, it's not, it's not prostate. Uh, uh, again, it's this, it's this difference that, that occurs here. And so what happens is that Putin is there while he's just blessed in the sense that he comes in. Oil prices start to go up. Uh, he, he leaves and oil prices start to go down. And that, that raises some other questions that I'll try to get into near the end of the talk because uh, this suggests that Medvedev, who's taken over as the pr president now, has ushered in a low price regime. Now, of course, it, it, you could make the argument, well, uh, did Putin cause the oil prices to increase? No. Obviously, he didn't. But he's there and he's able uh, to take advantage of it. So he leaves, oil prices go down, and, and this suggests that down the road, particularly if people begin to attribute all the problems that Russia may have because of lower oil prices, but that Putin may bring them back. He, he was our savior. We, we need him uh, for this particular purpose. So what did Putin do to contribute this? Well. Putin, uh, you, know, you know his background, he was trained as a lawyer in, at Leningrad University. He then went and he joined the KGB, was ultimately ended up in East Germany, and he worked there uh, until the Berlin Wall came down, at which point uh, he was jobless. Uh, they threw the, when they united with West Germany, the German, West Germans threw out the KGB headquarters, and so he went back to Leningrad, it was still Leningrad, and then he was hired by his former law professor, one of his former law professors, a man by the name of Subchak, to be the deputy governor uh, under, under Subchak. What you had, of course, traditionally in, in, in the Soviet Union was the deputy governor was in charge of foreign visitors, keeping an eye on them, and usually it was a KGB agent. And so that was a natural position for, for, for Putin. So he served in that function in, in, the, in the governor's office, then, of course, Subchak lost the election, and so Putin was uh, jobless once more. Along the way, in the middle, he began to, to ponder what could Russia do to come back? How could Russia erase what's going on here? 
in this, in this, this chaos. Um, and he thought long and hard about it, and he decided that the only thing Russia could do to bring itself back, it had lost its superpower status because with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the, uh, Russia was no longer as strong and it was with disarmament, so the uh, whole idea of the arms race was off and nuclear weapons were kind of put in storage, and so Russia still had nuclear weapons, but it was no longer considered a superpower, it was broke. So it couldn't do that. So he's, he's, he began to think what, what to do, and he came to the conclusion that Russia should take its raw materials, particularly its oil and gas, but it had other valuable ferrous and non-ferrous metals, and use them to move forward. And to do this, he would create what he came to call national champions. That, you know, the, the, Russia began the process of privatization in 1991, and in a sense, he would create these national champions. He would take some of these com uh, companies and basically bring them in again as, as uh, state entities, either officially or with lots of pressure to make them carry out the will of the state, to act on behalf of the state. So he wrote uh, something uh, equivalent to, a, not, was a little bit more than a master's degree uh, thesis, but not quite a PhD degree thesis, while he was there. And we've had copies of it. I mean, this is for real now. We've seen it and uh, um, uh, gone through it, and indeed he spells this out. There is one mention in there uh, of, a, of a study prepared by two professors from Pittsburgh University. And um, it turns out that then somebody went and looked at what these professors had written. Uh, Putin, of course, is doing this all in Russian, but because uh, this book had been translated into Russia, the professors from Pittsburgh's book had been translated into Russia, and they went and they looked at the Russian version, and they looked at what Putin wrote, and of course it turns out he took 10 to 15 pages verbatim uh, from that, that's how you know, the next time you see Putin, you say, did you really plagiarize these guys? Because there's really only one, he doesn't say take the whole, but you ask, uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, anyway, um, the point is, this is incorporated in, in what he does, and he carries this out. He, he, if you look at the, um, it's the third page, actually. They're not put together. This one, it says, Vladimir Putin elected president in 2000, March 2000. He quickly begins to purge to create national champions. And he's elected in March, formally. Uh, and you see, you go down to the first, uh, go down to Chairman Mirden, who had been the prime minister, but who, when he was removed as prime minister, was made the chairman of Gazprom. Gazprom, this company that we went to visit that was the former ministry of the gas industry. Chernomirden had actually been the uh, minister of the gas industry, uh, the ministry of the gas industry before he be went, on, went and became the deputy prime minister and then the prime minister. But he's stripping assets. Now that he's in there, he's beginning to strip assets. The stripping assets, taking them out and putting them into another company, one of which was called Itera. Now you go down to the fifth, fifth, uh, the fourth name down here as well, Rem Vyakarev. Vyakarev had been the CEO of Gazprom. He's removed the following year in, in May because he's also, he and Chernobyl together are stripping assets. And this firm Itra is a, is a very opaque kind of company. We don't know who exactly the, the owners are, but as best we can gather, they're the children of the executives of Gazprom. Uh, the wives of some of the executives and the mistresses of some of the executives. It's a very you know, compatible uh, range. But the, the most interesting thing is that where is it to a headquartered? It's headquartered in Jacksonville, Florida. Why, why Jacksonville, Florida? Why not? Uh, it's warmer there than Moscow and besides it's out, out of, of the range. So it's sitting there operating in, uh, in uh, Jacksonville. And what does any red-blooded uh, energy company do once you begin to operate in the United States, whether you're in, local, indigenous, or you're foreign? You get yourself a lobbyist. So uh, uh, Itera went out and got itself a lobbyist. Just by chance, uh, uh, they paid her a $300,000 retainer. Just by chance, um, only coincidence, her father happened to be a US congressman. Um, <laughs> by the name of Kurt Weldon from outside uh, of Philadelphia. Uh, and Kurt Weldon then becomes, in effect, a man from uh, Itera. He's also a specialist in arms control, but I'm, I'm going to focus instead on his, his energy interests. He invites the executives from uh, Itera to come to Washington, has a reception for them in uh, the Library of Congress. He goes to Jacksonville, even though that 
not quite as district, uh, to help them inaugurate their, their new headquarters. And he arranges for the U.S. Trade and Development Commission to give them an $800,000 grant to help them explore for natural gas in Russia. Again, something that's normally not, not the purview of um, the U.S. Trade and, uh, <coughs> and Development uh, Commission. Uh, again, it's you know uh, just buying up what what energy companies have done traditionally. Uh, this this kind of support. You also may remember Tom Delay from Texas. Uh, he, as far as I know, he was not involved with Itero. He was involved with a, with a Russian company called Naftasib. So he too was on the take from from uh, you know the Russian companies come they watch what American companies do you know let's let let's do the same thing the point is the Russians were operating this way and we're beginning to corrupt uh, the whole system so Itera then begins to develop this way and these national champions are Putin is taking them back because he he resents the stripping of assets and he wants these national champions to carry out the state's will and sure enough. Uh, when in the year 2000, when Putin uh, becomes the president, the share of, of the oil production coming from state companies is 10%. It used to be 100%, of course. By the time of 2008, it's back up to 50% again. So he's kind of regathering in, in the hands of these companies these kinds of assets and doing uh, this kind of, kind of thing. And in the meantime, also Putin begins to put his people in positions of power. So go to this. Sorry about that. Uh, go to the second uh, uh, page uh, where you see the Siloviki in business. Silo means strength. Uh, the Siloviki are called, what, what the best way we could translate it would be the law and order types. It would be in this country if the, if the, when you retire from the FBI, you go, you know, as a group uh, to work for energy companies or or important general dynamics, or from the Pentagon, or from the CIA. So, you know, there's what do you do with a retired uh, Pentagon uh, general? Well, usually he goes uh, double dips and he goes and, and works this kind of way. This is the same kind of thing that was going on here. And Putin begins to remove, to purge, as he's purging the first echelon of oligarchs, if you know, on that, on that, on that other page we just looked at. He got rid of Gusinski, he got rid of Beresovsky, he got rid of Kartakovsky, the bottom one, of course, Yukos. Uh, Yukos, uh, you know, the, the notorious case in 2003. Yukos's assets are taken, are given to Rosneft. So go back here, about the middle of the first of the Soloviki in business, you can see the name Igor Sechin. If you look down the bottom, you see the star. He was a former member of the KGB. He worked with Putin in St. Petersburg. Putin, when he comes to Moscow, brings with him his cohort, his buddies, and he begins to give them patronage. He, he pushes out the old oligarchs, brings in again a second echelon of oligarchs, and you can see the kinds of position there here. Uh, go up uh, to the fifth name, Dmitry Medvedev. Medvedev had worked with Putin in, in St. Petersburg. He, he, when he, when um, Putin goes to Moscow, he brings Medvedev down with him. He becomes the chief of the Kremlin administration, and then ultimately, of course, he's uh, Russia's um, uh, Ru president of Russia today. And along the way, he becomes chairman of Gazprom until he becomes the president. And then uh, there's a kind of a um, musical chair, and one of the other uh, people comes in. Uh, let's see if I've got his name on here, takes over as the, pre as the chairman now of Gazprom. So it's all in the family in, in that sense. And so Putin has all these people that he's passing out goodies and they become, uh, I say, the second echelon of oligarchs. Then, then go down to the bottom and where, the, where there's princelings. This is what the Chinese call the children of the Politburo members who go and pick up uh, jobs uh, in industry, work particularly for companies that are trading with China. And you can see what's happening here. This did not happen in the Soviet era. Uh, they, they, they didn't, the, the children of the Politburo members usually went into think tanks, academic life. Here, uh, had the governor of St. Petersburg, her son's working for Vinesh Torg Bank. Go down to the bottom, that's a, probably the best illustration. Uh, Patrushev, who was 
the, was the head of the KGB until just a government shakeup until now. Two sons. One works uh, for Vinesh Torg Bank and the other is working for an, advise, an advisor or an assistant to the head of Rosneft. Rosneft, the company that I've just been talking about again. Rosneft, that, that oil company where, where, where they're all there. So what happens is that um, you, you get these people coming in, taking over, <coughs> going in the family business. Gazprom uh, begins as oil prices go up, as energy prices go up <coughs> on Putin's wash, Gazprom's capitalized value. You know, they take, add up the value of all the stock of, of Gazprom. When he, t when, when he comes in in 2000, the total value of Gazprom stock is $9 billion. Uh, last, uh, as June of this year, it's, you'll hear what's happened since in a second, but as June last year, it had raised, risen from, from $9 billion to about $350 billion. Some of you, I suspect, are here because you want to know what happened to the stock that you bought from Gazprom, uh, because it went up so. I mean, this was uh, American hedge funds were, were buying that security because it was one of the fastest rising, uh, and it looked like it was doing very well, but then, as I say today, uh, it's fallen to $120 billion. So from $9 billion in 2000 to $350 billion in the beginning of the summer uh, to today's collapse uh, to 120 uh, As I read in the book, the, it had the third largest capitalized value after ExxonMobil and then uh, uh, General Electric. Today, because of this collapse, uh, it's 13th, so it's already, uh, Gazprom has fallen in the ranks uh, this way. Um, so <clears throat> you've got this, this kind of incredible uh, uh, change that's been taking place with riches falling to, to Putin's friends. It pays to be a friend of Putin because you're going to benefit. <clears throat> there are also rumors about Putin himself. Uh, I did not put it in the book because my editor said you don't have documentary proof. I do not have documentary proof, but there are rumors that Putin himself has gotten large quantities of Gazprom stock, maybe $5 billion worth at least until this collapse. Um, so it, it, the, the odds are if he doesn't have Gazprom stock, some of his other friends have, are very closely involved in energy companies, particularly a company called Gunvar where the owner of the company is his next door neighbor in St. Petersburg and they're kind of their, the Dacha district and uh, he's, he's there uh, and the feeling is that he's benefited because his friend has uh, directed stock uh, in his direction. Okay, um, so that's, that in itself is intrinsically interesting as far as I'm concerned, but turn to the last page, uh, which I hope is readable. Uh, Europe's reliance on Russian gas. <clears throat> I, I had been giving lectures about energy before and um, I'd heard rumors but I had really hadn't any uh, statistics to, to show that Russia was playing an increasingly large role in supplying energy to the European countries. Um, and so I finally said, well, I got, you know, go check it out. So I went to Litauer Library at, at Harvard and uh, dug up the International Energy Agency's uh, uh, handbooks and got the different figures for how much energy and what percentage of energy, uh, I cal calculated what percentage of energy or what percentage of gas was going, f uh, f coming from Russia to these different countries. I went back and I put this table together. I had it all just individual countries before, but then you put it down together and, and I saw this and I said, oh my God, uh, this is really uh, something that is sensational, really sensational, and uh, I should write a book about it. And that's really what provoked me uh, to do it. Look, look, look here, take the, the last column on the right. Uh, look at Germany. But look at Europe for that matter. 31% of its imports come from Russia. Germany, 42%. Uh, and the total consumption, uh, 39%. Total consumption for Europe's not that high. But you go down the list and you can see, you know, how could Austria be 135%? Well, uh, statistics, but because they, they import, uh, they export more than, than they consume, but they're importing large quantities this way, but then they re-export it. But, but look at even Italy receives a large quantity, and then you go down to the East, Eastern European countries, and it's 100%. Now, that's uh, terribly uh, uh, significant because 
Um, with oil, if there's an embargo on the export of oil, as there was in 7, 1973, uh, when the OPEC countries did that, that's a problem. It causes difficulties. We have gas lines, oil prices go up, but we can still get oil because if we can't get it from Iran uh, or the OPEC countries, there's still other countries out there that we're producing, including Russia, where we could get it from. So a little inconvenience and, but it, it, and higher prices and maybe a recession or two, but it, 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 we can get, get, get access to it. <clears throat> Gas is different. Gas is different because it comes, at this point, only from the pipelines, like a, like a uh, you know, it's just your li a lifeline, and you take that lifeline away, an umbilical cord, you take it away and there's nothing there. Now, it's true, the life, you know, the, the gas pipeline in, in Europe that these people have at Gazprom also takes gas from Algeria, takes gas from the North Sea, but those supplies are being depleted. And most of the new supplies are going to come from Russia. And if you're on the eastern end, uh, of that pipeline. If you're at this end of the pipeline, uh, then you're very, as Germany is, then you're very heavily dependent on Russia. And by the time it comes from Algeria, there's not much left. So it's that, that pipeline, the gas pipeline, gives you political clout that far surpasses the influence that would come just from prices. So uh, Russia does very well in terms of generating export revenue from oil. Guess the gas is not that expensive, but the gas gives them the political clout that you sense when you go up into Gazprom headquarters and you see those dispatchers uh, with that kind of, uh, of power. And it's that that is reflected in this table and it shows you just how influential Russia is now. And if you're Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany now, and you, you see these figures, and you have to know about those figures. Uh, you understand that there's no sense riling the Russians over an issue that's not important to the well-being of Germany. And so you can understand why Angela Merkel now, even though she's tough and you know, comes from East Germany and was really regarded initially as being very str uh, strongly opposed in a, and would be tough dealing with the Russians while well, she seems now to be a pussycat. Uh, and when it comes to whether should Ukraine and, and Georgia be admitted to NATO, she's been opposed to it. Uh, and maybe she should be opposed, maybe we should be opposed to it too, but this is a complete change in her attitude uh, reflecting, I think, the realization that they are really being held hostage. And indeed in 2006, in January, when the Ukrainians cut back the, the gas that was coming through from Russia to them, they cut back to Germany and the Germans really uh, experienced what could happen. It happened subsequently as well when the Belarusians uh, did, did much the same uh, kind of thing. So that's basically what the book is about. Now, let me just say a few words about what's been happening uh, within the last uh, couple uh, weeks uh, because it's, it, again, it's, it's quite different and, and, and things change so quickly. Uh, when uh, Putin went out after uh, Khodorkovsky, uh, there was good reason for it. Khodorkovsky was quite arrogant. Uh, he indicated that he was going to run for president after Putin's term expired. Uh, he boasted that he controlled 100 votes in the Duma and he helped defeat a proposal to raise taxes. He did a variety of things that were, uh, he, he insulted and uh, accused one of Putin's buddies of corruption. Uh, just the whole thing because I'm led to believe that he, you know, he had a net worth of about $15 billion. I'm led to believe when you have that much money it's pretty easy to be uh, arrogant. Uh, uh, again, it's not something I've experienced personally, but, but uh, I'd like to try it at, at some point. Uh, anyway, there, there we are. So he, he, what does he do? He, he, you know, he has uh, Khodorkovsky arrested. Uh, it's a kind of a rigged jury trial. Uh, uh, the company is declared bankrupt because it hasn't paid its taxes. And there was, there was some justification there for, for these accusations. In any case, uh, uh, Khodorkovsky is sentenced to uh, prison in Siberia. He's still serving his term. Yukos is dismantled. The, the assets are taken over by Rosneft, that same uh, company again. And, and Russia goes on. Not, you know, Yukos may be broken up, but there's not much, not many waves created now. Just a few weeks ago, Putin began to do something similar. Uh, Russia has been hurt by inflation, 
that inflation now is about 14%. And the Russians are nervous about inflation. They have a terrible bad bout of it, terribly bad bout of it in the uh, uh, early 90s uh, with you know, something like prices went up 26 fold, not 26%, but 26 times. So it basically wiped out savings. It was catastrophic. So they're very nervous about this. And, and so he be, Putin began to concern himself, what could he do to reduce inflation? And he was led to believe, rightly or wrongly, that one of the steel companies was charging more for its steel within Russia, where there was a building boom, than what it was uh, charging uh, when, it, when it exported. This is a company called Mech Mechtel. Uh, and so he called in the president, so I, you know, explain what, why there seems to be this discrepancy in prices. And the president uh, of the company pleaded get, uh, sick, illness, he said, I'm in the hospital, I can't come. And Putin says, I don't believe you. I'll send out the Kremlin doctor to check you out uh, to see what was happening. And immediately this brought back uh, an echo of the uh, Yukos affair. And so what happened is that the stock fell maybe 70, 80%. And it wasn't just that the stock of this company fell. When, when the case of Yukos, that was different. In, in the case of Mechtel, the stock fell. And this set off reverberations throughout the whole stock market. So the Russian stock market was subjected to this kind of thing in a way that preceded the worldwide collapse. Now, why is that? Well, that's an interesting question. Why is it, in other words, why is uh, the, the Putin's uh, assault on Mechtel produce such different results than on Yukos? Well, in part because Russia has become now part of the globalized picture in a way that it wasn't earlier. One of Stalin's greatest contributions to the Soviet Union was he decided that Russia, the Soviet Union, should be kept immune from the business cycle manipulations as he saw them that would afflict uh, the capitalist world, world periodically. Why should the Soviet Union be caught up in these things? And so he made the currency uh, non-convertible. The ruble was no longer convertible. He destroyed the stock market. He, he nationalized all industry uh, and indeed introduced the five-year plans which were not affected by the depression of the 1930s. In fact, they benefited because there were jobs, they could hire the engineers from General Electric who were laid off, and Russia began to grow. And it began to grow unevenly, but still was an impressive rate of growth. Um, but by the 19, late 1970s, 1980s, Russia began to fall behind despite that. It fell behind in terms of quality. It fell behind in terms of innovation. The planning system did not lend itself to working in a high technology world. The Soviet Union could not master the high, the high technology that's associated with electronics, with biotechnology. It just couldn't do that kind of thing. And so beginning with Gorbachev in particular, but in, in, enhanced by Yeltsin and in particular by, again, by, by Putin, they began to involve themselves again with the globalized economy. One of Putin's greatest accomplishments was that he made Russia a member of the G8. This was one of the things he was proudest of. So, Russia's part of the G8, and so now what happens is that when you start to go after Mechtel, people, the, well, you've got a lot of foreign capital that's gone into Russia. A lot of foreign capital that went into buying up the stock in Russian companies, of these energy companies in, in, in particular. And when they saw Putin harassing this uh, executive, they said, we better get out of here because this may be another Yukos so and we don't know where it's going to go. And so there was a panic and they moved out, which in a sense preceded the overall collapse of, of, of the stock market. And so it's caught up this way. Then on top of it, uh, there was this trouble in Georgia. The Russians don't think it's an invasion. We think it's an invasion. Whatever it is, the confrontation in Georgia, which brought back images of the old Soviet Union, R Russia as a bully. However it was, it certainly was a bully. Whether what was cause and effect, uh, you can argue, and uh, the Russians, again, see it very differently than, than we do. But but whatever it was, it was again something that frightened those who'd put money into Russia. And so there was this capital flight of billions of dollars, which again caused, caused this, uh, this collapse. So the irony is now that maybe Stalin was right. Uh, who would have thought uh, that that would have been the case? But, but there we are. So uh, in, the, in the result now of, of the Mechtel thing, of the Georgian thing, and then the world globalization of the f f uh, chaos and the, the panic in the outside world, uh, the Russian stock market now has taken the biggest hit of any large industrial country. 
Iceland I don't count uh, in this thing. The Russian stock market has fallen more than 70 percent. Uh, as bad as things are here, the Russian situation is much worse. And what has happened, of course, is that these oligarchs, both the original and the second, have been hurt correspondingly. And what has been happening is that, like most, uh, uh, well, not meant like many people who are very wealthy, they were using the stock they had to borrow money so they could buy more stock and expand. So a man like Deripaska, who's replaced Khodorkovsky as the richest man in Russia, uh, had borrowed money uh, to buy up stock in Magna, which is a Canadian company, automobile parts supplier, General, uh, General Motors, and also a, a, a German contracting firm. And the bank, the price stock fell, the collateral fell, the bank called a loan, and he had to simply uh, walk away from $200 million worth of investment. And so they are now, the oligarchs now, both the old and the new, are, are being hit this way and the whole thing has turned around. But for Putin, it still is a, a very heady time. And, um, and at least until recently, he, he well, I was just, we just had another one of our meetings in September and he's, he, he's still pretty, pretty strong, pretty assertive. Uh, and doesn't show any sign of, of lying awake night worrying about what's going to happen to the stock. But uh, just how, how much things have changed, just Russia is back, that's the more message. And how much they've changed, I will leave you with a closing statement from Putin. This was a press conference that he held in June 2007. And I'll read you the transcript, the translated transcript. Uh, the correspondent from Der Spiegel says, Mr. President, former Federal Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder called you a pure Democrat. Do you consider yourself as such? And the Putin, I'm reading now Putin's read, he laughs. Am I a poor, pure Democrat? Of course I am. Absolutely. But you know what the problem is? It's not even a problem. It's a real tragedy. The problem is that I'm all alone. Uh, uh, the only one of my kind in the whole wide world. And, and now this, what he says, is correct. Just look what's happening in North America. It's simply awful. Torture, homeless people, Guantanamo, people detained without trial and investigation. Just look at what's happening in Europe. Harsh treatment of demonstrators, rubber bullets and tear gas used first in one capital, then in another. Demonstrators killed in the streets. Well, you know, it's, it's right, but look, look over your shoulder, man. I mean, you know, was, but anyway, th that's beside the point. He ends that intervention with this. There's no one to talk to since Mahatma Gandhi died. Well, you know, I mean, again, with this kind of, of feeling of we're there and I'm doing these things and it's, it's just an incredible turnaround and there we are. So, now, are there questions? Thank you, Thank you Professor Gom. We, uh, we do have time for questions, and what we'd like you to do is, uh, we have microphones in the back on each side of the room, and if you could please go to the microphone to ask your question. Um, once the question and answer period is done, I just want to remind everyone that we do have copies of the professor's book on sale, and we'll have a reception uh, in the room next door. So, if anyone has a question, please step to the microphone. There's one there. Okay. Oh, it's just on. I think you have to go to the microphone, but if you can't get there, uh... <laughs> I'd just like to know what is the confrontation in Georgia? What? what, what I'm sorry. Is say that. The confrontation in the confrontation. Georgia. Well, uh, the, the, the there was a fight over South Ossetia and. Uh, uh, Abkhazia, and uh, there was a bloody battle. Is that, th if that's what you're asking, man, I don't mean I don't mean to. You know, there was a war. Yeah. Well, what happened? What? Well, what 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 the what the Russians see uh, is that we provoked it. Um, what, as as they see it, uh, Saakashvili, who was trained at Columbia, we sent over to take over Georgia. And you know, there was an election. He won. It was. He pushed out, uh, uh, um, oh good lord, um, Shevardnadze. He pushed out Shevardnadze, he defeated Shevardnadze, and he uh, then began to he cracked down on a lot of things. And one of the things he, he wanted to do was to kind of put together Georgia. Georgia was falling apart because Ossetia, which had been a, a province, broke away. 
uh, he sees it as again under Russian uh, initiative. The Russians were encouraging them to do that. And the same thing in Abkhazia, um, and so he did. He did bring in one another province which was in the south, but that wasn't contiguous to Russia. Ossetia and Abkhazia are pretty are near the Russian border, and the Russians uh, encouraged them. They uh, to you know, break away and they provided troops and supplies. The Russians see, however, that we had, you know, we have American military advisors in Georgia. There are about 150 American military advisors. We were there training them because the Georgians were sending their troops to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. So we say that's what they're doing. The Russians see, you've got advisors in our backyard, military advisors in our backyard, you're training them to create these problems. Uh, so the Georgians think that uh, uh, Ossetia, North, South Ossetia and Abkhazia are theirs. The Russians say these are independent groups. They want to declare independence and then they declare independence. They want to uh, line up and become part of, of Russia. So it's, it's one of these things. I, I have a cartoon that I p uh, cut from the New Yorker. Um, it, it, it shows a woman, it's probably my wife, uh, with a cell phone and she's talking to one of her friends says, we've reached an agreement. Uh, everything I say is right and everything he says is wrong. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's one of those situations where the Russians see we're wrong and we see where they're wrong, but it, but it is actually a, um, something that, that, that just the two sides aren't going to ever, I think, come to an agreement. But they view this as a form of hostility in their backyard and that's one of the reasons why uh, they are eager to embrace Chavez in Venezuela. On top of that, we sent our ships, our naval ships, into the Black Sea, which is kind of their Great Lakes as they see it. And uh, again, they feel that's needlessly provocative. That's why they're sending uh, Russian naval ships to Venezuela. So I, I, I hope that gets at what you're asking. Yeah? Uh, I haven't been in Russia since the mid-1970s. And I remember people getting on trains carrying big loaves of bread. Yeah. I wonder what the food situation is now. Ah, uh, happy, ooh, well, it's not just food, uh, it's everything. I mean, Russia is back. When I say Russia is back, it's back in a, it's an incredible way. Uh, if any of you have been there recently, this may say as much about Boston as it says about Moscow, but the shops in, in Moscow have, carry more elegant goods than they do in Boston. Uh, and the traffic, traffic jams are incredible. One of the things we, you know, we meet, I say we meet with Putin every September. The, this is the 5th September and one of the questions he was asked, what is your greatest contribution? And he says one of the greatest things that has happened on my watch is that when I came in uh, office 1990, over 30%, 33%, one third of the population was below the poverty line. Now it's down to 15, 17%. And this is a legitimate claim it's oil that has done that, but, but it's happened and it's there. Uh, as some measure, um, we had a meeting in downtown Moscow on a Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon, again, that's probably a bad time, but uh, they put us in a hotel beyond the Ring Road, uh, a Holiday Inn no less, uh, um, and it took three and a half hours to get from downtown to, it would be the equivalent of 128 in Boston. Well, sometimes Boston can be slow, but not three hours. I mean, and it's about the same distance because of the traffic jams. And uh, not everybody has a car. There are still people who are, are uh, poor, some homeless, which is a new wrinkle in, in the post-Soviet era. Uh, in the countryside, it's not as good as it is in Moscow or St. Petersburg. But even in the countryside, there, there's a vast improvement. And so food is, is not the problem. Russia is exporting uh, wheat again. Now that's partly because they're importing American chickens. Uh, whereas before they would use the grain to feed their livestock. Now they don't have to do that anymore. They just buy the livestock, import the, the livestock. So the, there's nothing in Russia that you can't find, uh, nothing in the United States that you can't find in a Russian shop, in very elegant shops. As I say, that, that just uh, boggled the mind. There's some, uh, we stayed if, this last time in the Aurora Marriott Hotel, and there's a pedestrian mall that's there, it's, it's, uh, just lined with uh, elegant shops. And there's also a street 
behind the Metropole Hotel, which again is closed off, where there are guards at either end of the street because the shops are are so elegant uh, and you know so extravagant. So, so it, this is this new wealth again. That's part of the reason why Putin is so popular. Hi, um, Albert Golson, Foreign Policy Association. Um, could you just comment on the possibility that there uh, might be a version of a um, gas OPEC with Russia, Iran, and Qatar? Uh, yep. The possibility that that actually could come to fruition, what their objectives are, just a comment on that? Sure. Uh, if you look in today's, uh, I, I haven't seen it in the New York Times yet, but it's in the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. Yesterday, there was a meeting with the CEO of uh, Gazprom and, and um, uh, Iran and Qatar, Qatar talking about a, a, a gas OPEC. I talk about that actually in the book, not that they met yesterday, it's not, that, it's not quite that uh, uh, fast, but um, I, I'm skeptical of that. I'm skeptical for a couple of reasons and I spell it out. First of all, Russia did not join OPEC. The OPEC members would love to have a Russia member because what happens now, Russia gets all the advantages of being a member of OPEC without the penalties. OPEC decides to cut back, Russia does not have to do that and in fact, takes advantage of the fact that oil prices are pushed up as the supply diminishes. So it's a beneficiary in a way that the other countries, if they follow the rules, can't do. That's number one. So Russia has not been a joiner uh, in, in, in this. They get all, why should they? They get all the benefits without being a member. Uh, the second thing is with, the nat with a gas uh, OPEC, I call it an OGEC, Organization of Gas Exporting Country, uh, because uh, with the pipeline, uh, you don't have to, if you've got that pipeline, you don't have to worry about somebody trying to uh, come in and compete with you to lower the price until you get to the liquefied natural gas. And even then, it's not going to happen. In other words, there's no standby pipeline that another gas exporting country will start using if, if you don't uh, lower your price. The reason for that is the gas pipelines are so expensive, three to five billion dollars. You can't have one just sitting around there unless it's being used. So. Um, the likelihood that uh, that's going to work. Russia, if it wants to, can unilaterally say, I'm going to raise prices to those, particularly those countries that are 100% dependent on it. And the same thing with, with the others. Now, at some point, they're talking about liquefied natural gas, but even then, that requires a long-term contract because it's so expensive to have the processing plant to take the uh, gas, freeze it, then the, the tankers are very expensive, and then the the unfreezing that is also expensive. So, so again, all these things require a, you know, a year, two or three year contract. So that kind of thing I, I don't think lends itself to an OPEC, uh, OGEC uh, type arrangement. So I, I, I'm, th there had been some proposals to do something earlier. It's not just yesterday. Uh, something earlier and they never came to fruition because the Russians just don't care. So, Sir, in your view, why hasn't the Bush administration considered an arms embargo against Russia after the Georgia invasion? Uh, an, arms, it, an arms embargo? An arms embargo. And do you think it would have any effect? Uh, I don't think it would have. I, it's hard for me to see what effect it would have. Uh, Russia is the second world's, the world's second largest exporter of munitions. So they don't need ours. What we worry about is that uh, what we would like to do is curb theirs uh, rather than uh, tell them they can't have ours. Uh, you know, major supplier, the, ma the major supplier to China um, and to the third world in, in, in particular. So I don't, I don't see, it, it wouldn't do anything, certainly in the energy sector. Um, uh, I don't, so um, there are other you know, Ronald Reagan, when he was president, uh, tried to do everything he could to prevent the building of the gas pipeline. There was an embargo there, and, and he refused to give licenses to General Electric, which wanted to sell them compressors, which they needed to move the turbines and compressors, which they needed to move the gas uh, as a way of sabotaging the building or preventing the building of that gas pipeline because Reagan, whatever I thought of him or anybody else thought of him, he understood that that gas pipeline would give Russia enormous political clout, which indeed they have, which I think I came to see belatedly, not, not the way he saw it. Uh, uh, so then the British 
simply provided that Margaret Thatcher, despite the fact that she was Reagan's buddy, uh, in, this was a big contract for the British firm, so they provided the gas pipeline is up, and, and that's the kind of control they have now. Yeah. Uh, Professor Goldman, uh, because of the recent conflicts in Georgia, what's your opinion, opinion on uh, the long-term relationship between Russia and Central Asian republics such as Kazakhstan and, and Turkmenistan? Uh, the relationship between Russia and the Central Asians, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky because the Central Asians have lots of gas in particular. Um, and what is happening now, or what has happened is the Russians are the link between Central Asia and Europe, for that matter, to even to uh, Central Asia and China and Japan uh, to some extent. And, the Russians play this. I mean, this is again, say the the OPEC, the OKEC kind of thing. What they were doing at one point was paying Turkmenistan, which one of the major has the major deposits of natural gas, maybe fifth or sixth in the world. Uh, they were paying them the equivalent of fifty dollars a thousand cubic meters, taking the gas, transmitting it through the pipeline through to Germany, and charging Germany two hundred dollars a thousand cubic meters, keeping the difference. So uh, the Central Asians understood that, they didn't like that, uh, but they had no choice. So there was a proposal by the Europeans, the European Union, to create a, a bypass pipeline uh, that would go from Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, Turkey, then uh, go through it. And indeed, there is a gas and oil pipeline up in Georgia um, to, to at least provide for oil. They're building a gas pipeline now alongside of it. I predict in the book that the Russians wouldn't like that and they would do everything they could to destabilize Georgia. Uh, if I could only have such insight with the stock market, uh, 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 it would be much more to my advantage. But, but it was clear that the Russians wouldn't like that. So the, the, the uh, Central Asians are trying to encourage this, but you need three things to have a pipeline that bypasses Russia. You've got to have a source of supply. You have to have customers who are willing to pay for it. You've got to have somebody who's going to finance the pipeline. And Putin understands that. And the minute that, that a country says, well, uh, we're like Kazakhstan, we are willing to send some of our gas through that pipeline, a proposal has been that they should build a gas pipeline underneath the Caspian and then to Azerbaijan and then out. And the minute they proposed that, Cheney went to uh, Vice President Cheney went to Kazakhstan to encourage them to participate in that. But Cheney goes home immediately, Putin comes to visit. You don't want to do that. We'll give you a better deal, send it through us. Uh, the uh, Hungarians and some of the others say, well, you know, we'll buy that, that gas. There's this, uh, an alternative called Nabucco after the opera uh, uh, to buy that gas and Putin comes in. Don't uh, buy that, uh, you know, uh, don't buy the gas from them. We'll give you, give you a better deal. And so he knocks the pins out, and, and at that point, no financier is going to come along because you don't either have a source of supply and you don't have a group of customers. The European Union has been uh, not very good on this. The European Union really, it's in their interests more than our interests, and they have not been uni united uh, in this, and the Russians are able to pick one off after another by offering them a better deal, so there's no cohesion there. So. It, it's going to be a very difficult thing to put together, and I'm not optimistic about it. This is perhaps a follow-on question. The Stratfor.com has a long essay outlining the global challenges the next U.S. president will face. And with our, uh, do you think it likely that a new president would try to uh, sufficiently improve relationships with Russia <coughs> that we could deal with other problems that are pressing upon the country and in for for example uh, backing away from the notion that Ukraine and Georgia could uh, become members of the EU or even be considered in a realistic sense emerging democracies I don't know um, um, that, that you raise some interesting issues there um, let me back up a little bit and say these, these five meetings we've had with uh, Putin, each time he brings up George Bush in the most complimentary way, unprovoked. He just brings up this last meeting, he started, in the middle of the discussion, he starts talking about George. 
He doesn't say George, but he's George. And, and it's out of context. And what, where, who, what, who's George? What's he talking about? And it's George Bush. Uh, what, two, last year he starts talking about George, George Bush. And he says, you know, there was pressure on George Bush not to go to the G8 meeting uh, in St. Petersburg. Uh, but Bush promised me he would go and he went. And I value that he held to his word. Um, uh, four years ago, uh, he said, you know, if I were to vote in the United States, I'd vote for George Bush. Nobody asked him who he, he just volunteered that information. I thought for a time maybe this was to sabotage George Bush, but it was, it was clear he feels that way. And George Bush, I've met with only once, uh, and he has positive things to say about Putin, although there's a little more hesitancy there. And you know, there, if you've watched them, it's the oddest couple that you could uh, ever see. If you watch their body language, I mean, they just, in the presence of each other, they just are completely relaxed. And, and uh, you know, the story um, about, well, <laughs> how strange it is uh, when, uh, when George Bush was running for election the first time in 2000, he and Condoleezza Rice were attacking Al Gore for being too close to the Russians, too gullible. So he said, well, uh, when I'm president, we won't have any more summit meetings. We'll have multilateral meetings, but no one-on-one -on -one because the, the United States gave too much away. Then in, in April, he changes his mind after an American plane runs into, uh, you want me to stop? Uh, um, I should give shorter answers. Um, anyway, the, the United States decides that we'll have a summit meeting. After all, Bush goes to Ljubljana, Slovenia, and you know, he goes into that meeting and he comes out and he says, I looked into his eyes and I got a sense of his soul. Remember, that was the weirdest statement that, that I did. How could you look into his eyes and get a sense of his soul? Well, there's an answer to that. In preparation for this meeting, Condoleezza Rice had given Bush a book called First Person. Uh, it's a short, short book, small pages, big print, um, and uh, in it, it's a series of interviews with uh, uh, friends of, parents uh, of, of, of uh, Putin. And it, he says, in 1993, um, he and his wife went to Israel to, and went to Jerusalem, and his mother, before he went, said, here, take this cross and have it blessed by the priests in the Russian Orthodox Church, which is a very strong presence there. He did, he brought it home. He wore it occasionally. Uh, one time after that, they built a, a dacha with a sauna. <laughs> it was faulty. It caught fire. Everything. He was naked. Everything burnt down. He thought he lost the cross. A fireman uh, finds the cross and gives it to Putin. So at that meeting, the first meeting that they have in Slovenia, Bush goes into the room and he says to Putin, tell me about the cross. And Putin doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, out of context, what? Tell me about the cross. And he tells him about the cross, and it's after that he walks out and he says, I looked into his eyes and I got a sense of his soul. For a born-again Christian, this was a very important phenomenon. That's a true story. I, I told that at, at a lecture in Jacksonville, not to the Itra people, but to another group. And at the end, a big guy comes up to me and he says, I'm George Bush's uncle, and I want to talk to you about that story. I said, did I get it wrong? He says, well, only in part. It wasn't in the middle of the meeting as it was when they first walked into the room, George Bush was asking about. And that established a bond between them. And then, you know, after 9-11, uh, Putin was the first leader to get through to Bush because Bush was flying around in a plane and on the hotline, he could get through where nobody else did to wish, uh, express his, his concern, his condolences, and offer cooperation. So that's why they have this bond. That's, that's, a, that's a short answer. Uh, I mean, there, there are people up here, I better go. Yes? Um, I heard a former official of the US government uh, on the radio last week talking about what's going on in the markets as being financial warfare. And I'm wondering, given the black budget and uh, given the fact that in election years, especially when bushes are running, the price of oil seems to go down, is it possible that there's some manipulation going on here behind the scenes? Well, uh, you know, I'm not a commodity dealer, so I, I, uh, it's, uh, it's a little tricky um, for me to, to in intervene there. But, you know, there, there, I suspect there was some um, speculation before because what was happening of course was that there were no new fields being uh, discovered and and the demand was growing and, and not just from us or the traditional companies but from the BRIC companies uh, Russia, India, Brazil, the new emerging countries, uh, China uh, so demand was going up and you could kind of forecast the future that it would, prices certainly were going to rise whether they should have been double 
or gone up as much as they did, I, I don't know. But then once the recession begins to set in, you know, high prices, that was a form of tax, as you've heard. Uh, you know, because you have less disposable income after you've paid those high prices and you know, there are all kinds of forms of that. Consumption of energy in the United States actually has dropped because prices have gone up so. So uh, whether it was the conspiracy, uh, I, 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 I don't think so, but uh, you can't take my word for it. It's one of my friends, he's got to ask a question. Go ahead. Uh, Marshall, what is your latest reading on the relationship between Medvedev and Putin based on your most recent meeting yeah. with Putin and other factors? Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's the first time I've met with Medvedev. He, we met with him at, this, at these uh, Valdai Hill meeting sessions. Um, and, and reading from it, reading the kinds of things he says, you know, it, it, the, the sense was that Vieta was more of a liberal, more, uh, he's trained as a lawyer, he taught law, of course, Putin was uh, trained as a lawyer. He did not teach law. Medvedev comes from a very different background. His, his father is a physicist who taught in one of the technical, universe, technical universities. His mother teaches language and literature, so he comes from an academic background. And I found that my academic friends bring up children that are a little flakier than uh, uh, children who come from a tougher, rigid home, whereas Putin, of course, came and lived in a communal apartment and, uh, you know, th thuggish kind of, you know, tough, real tough, uh, bullying kind of, of thing. Uh, and, and Medvedev has come along, and you look at Medvedev, he's short, uh, and the kinds of things that he says, particularly when we met with him, it was over, it was a two and a half hour meeting. Um, he was talking about Georgia, he was talking about a lot of things, and I had the feeling he was playing, he was playing house. You know, he was playing adult. Uh, saying things that he really didn't uh, feel, uh, and he, he, he wears, I, I don't know if he wears elevator shoes or not, but it, he gives you that impression, and he wears high collars, it, 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 nothing, he reminds me of the Mad Hatter, you know, you know with the, cotton, the big hat. The only time he came alive and really felt on his own, is, I had a chance to ask him a question, is, you know, you, you've complained, you, uh, you're a lawyer too, but you did not said this, but he said, you've complained uh, that, uh, I said to him, you complained that Russia has now been afflicted by legal nihilism, which is a, clearly an attack on Putin. Um, and my friends in the oil business tell me, when I ask them, why do you stay there? Uh, you know, uh, Shell, uh, ExxonMobil, Total, uh, ConocoPhillips, they come in, they invest, and suddenly the Russians come and seize their property and, and take it away. Uh, I said, why do you stay there and tolerate that? Why, why do you go and invest more money? The billions of dollars in some cases have been taken away from them. I said, uh, uh, so one of them said to me, well, we can always, you know, what are our alternatives? That's where a lot of the energy is, that's where opportunity is. Should we go to Peru and deal with the Shining Path? That's our alternative. So I said to Medvedev, is that how you want to be treated? Do you want to be lumped together, classified with, with those? And at that point, he really got animated. No. He says, I believe in the rule of law. And he said, when I'm through here, I want, I want people to stop being opaque, to stop dealing under the counter, uh, and to be responsive that way. He said, we can pass laws, but then when it comes to doing business, the culture is such that they deal in cash. So there's no record of it. And he said, that's got to change with the culture, and that's one of the things he hopes to accomplish. So there he really came into his own, and there I was impressed. Up until that point, I, I really had the feeling that, that uh, you know, he was feeling uncomfortable and, and, and trying to make believe. Uh, so, but, but then, you know, then about, what about Putin? Down the road, I think, as, as he begins to put in place his subordinates, right now, you know, the Siloviki, they're all Putin's people. And so Medvedev, I don't think, can count on having uh, a, a support base that will follow along with him. So, but gradually this may happen, and then maybe four years, five years from now, uh, if, if people don't blame him for the drop in oil prices, he uh, may say, uh, uh, that old coot doesn't know what he's up to, you know, like a father and son uh, kind of arrangement where the son begins to say, I, I don't need to listen to him anymore. Excellent. Because as we can see, the topic of tonight's talk does remain very much relevant. And uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, 
I'd like to invite you to come next door to our reception and once again to thank uh, Marshall Goldman for his talk tonight. Uh, sorry about the handout. No, <laughs>